you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, while you're turning over there, continue to remember all those that has been mentioned for prayer requests, um, for Brother Kraft and situation with his leg, the Lord will continue um, to heal him. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. The Bible says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things, which, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we, re, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, and that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper, this morning on the thought, when did you first see Jesus? Lord, we thank you and we praise you and give you great glory and honor for all that you do for us this morning. Lord, we praise you that you sit on the throne there by your Father and we give you great praise for all that you do for us. Lord, this morning we pray for us for that you help us to preach what you've given us, Lord. That you would uh, strengthen us, Lord, that you would bind with us together this morning. Lord, we pray that you'd be honored, that you'd be lifted up, and that you'd be acknowledged in everything that we do. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and if you... Uh, no, the Corinthian letter, he scathed them pretty good. The church at Corinth was not doing well. Uh, you know, we live in a day and age today where people don't like to acknowledge if the church is not going well. But you know, the very best thing that we can do is acknowledge that and pray for it. You know, if things are not going well, why would you lie about it? If you were sick and went to the doctor, why would you not tell him you were sick? Oh, you know, everything's fine. I'm going, okay, well, you keep up that effort and you keep up that way. What ultimately will happen is that you'll die. In the same way with the church, instead of pretending that things are just hunky-dory and everything is going great, we ought to acknowledge when there was problems. Now, the church at Corinth, uh, Paul laid it out very, very specifically to them, even to the point in chapter 5, apparently there was a male member there that was uh, fooling around with his stepmother, and he says, y'all need to deal with this. You know what the very best thing a church can do, and I've seen this, uh, uh, is when a problem arises, deal with it. When a problem arises, just deal with it. And then that way they don't just build up and build up and build up until everything is completely out of control. And I believe as Paul was writing the Corinthian letter, he made that very apparent to them. Now, uh, back in our t uh, text, he says, But as it is written, and he's referring back to the book of Isaiah, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love Him. Now, when we began to think about eternity, and we began to think about stepping from this place into the very presence of the Almighty living God, really our minds cannot not even obtain that. Uh, we cannot really understand how glorious and how wonderful and how great it will be to step into the presence of the triune God uh, it, it above our fathom. 
And now the Lord God inspired some to write some things that maybe we could get an idea, but the Bible says even this, the half hath never yet been told. Yeah. So our understanding, uh, unfortunately, of heaven is just as finite as these little minds that we have. Uh, but the great things of God uh, are way beyond us. So as Paul is beginning to write them, he says you really can't even get it when you, in your head what a wonderful thing it is. Uh, verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Now, if you don't get anything else out of the message this morning, this is how you learn of God is by His Spirit. And you notice there your King James Bible, it's a large capital S Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. He's referred to the Holy Ghost a little further down just the same way. Uh, you know how I learned I was a sinner? By the Holy Ghost. You know how I learned that there was a Redeemer, a true Savior? You know what? We live in the South. There's not a, there's not a handful of people in Stewart County that's never heard the name Jesus, but they don't know who He is. See, that's revealed. Uh, a revealed truth is something that comes from God. I, I, I can make 2 plus 2 and equal 4, and that's logic, but that is not the things of God. And, and so we find as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he says, uh, what, what you know is revealed by the Spirit. But it's, uh, Verse 10, but, the, but God had revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the, sp the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, in one sense, uh, what a glorious verse that, you know, that, that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit searcheth and makes us understand the deeper things of truth of the Word of God. And at the same time, He's searching you. And that's a little troubling, is it not? You, you know how you're convicted of your sin? Because the Spirit searches you. He, he, know, he knows what makes you tick. He knows, he, you know what? This, uh, this one thing you learn is God knows you better than you know yourself. Right. You, 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 think, you think that you've arrived and you think that uh, you've got a, a sound understanding of things. Well, the Lord Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? And that's like logic and understanding how things happen. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, you know, there's a lot of people out there today that, that don't even acknowledge the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, same thing, different wording. Well, according to this, they don't even know God if that's true. If they deny the Holy Spirit and the revealer of truth, how could they possibly know God? Right. Yeah. It's an impossibility, is it not? According to, if, if that is true, and I believe that it is, so we find that salvation is a lot more deeper than accepting Jesus Christ. You know, whether you accept it or not, God's on the throne this morning. Do you ever think about that? It, it, you know, do you think Hillary Clinton is a redeemed woman? I don't. They're, they're not one one. Fruit of evidence that she would even acknowledge the things of God, but despite her disbelief, God is on the throne this morning, and the Lord Jesus Christ sits in His uh, at His left hand, doing uh, interceding on our behalf. So what she believes is immaterial, is it not? Yeah. Logic doesn't help you. What helps you is the Spirit. Logic will not say. Yeah, will not save a sinner, but the Lord Jesus Christ will. And as Paul is writing this, he makes that very apparently clear. Uh, verse twelve. Now we have not. Uh, now we have received not the spirit of the world. Now, I want you to see as Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, there is a spirit attached to the world. And it's growing every day. And the spirit that's in this world presently right now is the Antichrist. Yeah. Not the Antichrist. He may be living. He may already be. Uh, he may be even a man my age. But the spirit is there. You know, I think as Paul was writing uh, to young Timothy, he, he said, which is the spirit of Antichrist. 
And He wanted us to know even then that the spirit of, uh, of being against Christ is there. You know why people are so upset? You know, today, and I don't, I don't like to get into politics while I'm preaching, but you know why people, they're, they're not really so upset specifically at President Trump. They're, they're upset because they perceive the liberal group is losing ground. And there's a spirit that goes with that. That, that is the problem. So as he's writing, he says, he says there's a spirit that's attached to this world. And then we as the Lord's people, as true believers, if we've genuinely been saved and, and our sins have been forgiven, we ought, to, we ought to have a distaste for that spirit. We should not feel at home here. This should not where, you know, where we're ready to kick back and abide forever because the Bible says if we're genuine, that we're pilgrims and strangers. Yeah. We, we don't belong here. That, that this is not our home. And so Paul, as he's writing to the church at Corinth, he gives them a very good idea of how to see the Lord Jesus. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the world, in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, you know, you cannot explain faith using carnal things. I had a preacher one time, this was many, many years ago, he was at Bumpus Mill, so those of you that were there, when, uh, attended there with me years ago, I, I had, there was a, I, he was a guest preacher, I don't remember, I don't remember the man's name, but he was trying to explain faith. And he brought out a chair and set it in front of the pulpit and says, I have faith this chair will hold me up and sit down. No, no, you're, you're comparing carnal to spiritual. A, a spiritual understanding of faith goes a lot further than a pew holding up your body. It is spiritually discerned. And we live in a day and age today where that's not a popular truth. You see what I'm saying? And I think the result of that, instead of having people with true experiences with Christ, is what we have many times is, is church buildings full of lost people. And so he says, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, uh, the Holy Ghost... Uh, is the active agent of God in the here and now. As, as he was fixing to leave, the, the Lord Jesus said, I'll send you a comforter. And he came on the day of Pentecost. And ever since then, he, he has been the comforter of the Lord's people. He's been the encourager. He, you, you know how you learned you were lost and you needed a Savior? Through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you know how you, uh, how you learn the, the reality that Christ, in fact, is the answer? Through the Holy Spirit. That, that, that is how you learn. It, there, there's no, no other way to gain a spiritual truth except from the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, as uh, Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, he wanted them to understand this. Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, now you mark her down. If you get anything out of this message this morning, a natural man cannot receive the things of God. That's why you can't make somebody with logic understand that they need Christ. That's why with logic, you can't make them understand that Jesus was the very sinless Son of God and that He died for the sins of His people. Logic won't get it. Yeah. And that's a hated truth today. If you don't have a spiritual experience, the only thing I can come to is that you're still lost. You know, whether you accept you're a sinner or not, dear friend, you're a sinner. Right? That's the new Southern Baptist thing, except that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus Christ. Confess your sins. You know what? Whether you accept it or not, God's on the throne this morning. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that uh, if you have a relationship with Christ, when did, when did it happen? When did you see it? 
I'm going to read the Gospel of John very quickly. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 29. John 1 and verse 29. The Bible says this, The next day, John meaning John the Baptist, the, uh, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. I knew him not, but he, but I, I knew him not, but he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I'm come baptizing with water. And John bare reverence, saying, I saw the Spirit, notice who the active agent is, descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, can you imagine as he was walking there with his own disciples, John the, John the Baptist saw Christ and said, There he is. There he is. That's the one I've been talking about. You know what? You would think they would have been bowled over. But the best I understand about this, not one of them moved. Now, they did the next day. Two or three of them but can you imagine having followed John the Baptist two or three years, the whole time saying, Christ is coming, Christ is coming, Christ is coming, and then one day say, well, there He is. He's, he's really here. And no one doing nothing. You know what? I can. In fact, I've seen it. I've lived it. I understand that. And, and so what, what we find here is that it has to go way beyond logic and just some, some incidental facts concerning Christ, but it, it must be, in fact, a revealed truth. Verse 36, And looking upon Jesus as He walked, this is the next day, He saith, he saith Behold the Lamb of God. You know what that says to me? Don't give up. You know, the Lord be my helper. Here in a few days, I'll be out in Idaho, and I'll be saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Lord be my helper, and everything being saved, I'll be back here, and I'll be saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Hopefully very soon, I'll be out on the streets, somewhere here in Tennessee, saying, Behold the Lamb of God. And you know what? Very, very likely, few, few will be that will respond. But you know what? John wasn't upset. He got up the next morning and he did the very same thing again. See, that's faithfulness, is it not? You think he was a little disappointed? Do you think he's a little upset that none of these men that had been with him all this time responded? No, he wasn't. He just simply did it again. Notice the response in verse 37. And the two disciples heard him speak... And they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and said unto uh, them, following him, saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and, and, and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak, that followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his, bro his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted Christ. So the first paid person to witness to Peter concerning Christ was his brother Andrew. Uh, did he immediately believe? No, I surely don't think he did. Now, did he go? Yeah, he went. Did you believe the first time he went to church? I surely didn't. 
So you can be near unto Christ and not believe in Him. You see what I'm saying? You, you, uh, uh, salvation ex is experiential. Just because you believe something, you know, even history books will tell you that there was a man named Christ, but there is no redemptive knowledge until He saves you. But that is the difference. Facts will not help you in experience with Christ's will. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14. 14, verse 18. Matthew 14, verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He says, And He said, Bring them hither to Me. Now, what He was wanting was the five loaves and two fishes. Now, uh, you could preach all day and all night on the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men, but I want you to see this. This is the one that a lot of people miss in this. God uses whatever He wants to. You know what? Just as easily as He used the five loaves and the two fishes, He could have picked up dirt and, and, and made a bountiful feast. But you know what it teaches me? He uses the things that are available. He always did in His miracles. And so, you know who's available today? Me and you and you. And He'll use what's available in those that will lend themselves to service. And, and so we find that as, he, uh, uh, as He's performing this miracle, He says, bring, bring them to Me. And He commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to His disciples and His disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up the, of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. <clears throat> and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that was the feeding of the 5,000. Well, you just re always remember this, that was the feeding of 5,000 men besides the women and the children. Probably on this occasion, the reality is more like 25,000 were fed. But the real, the real thing in this, in this miracle was how many fragments were taken up? Twelve baskets full. And the reason that's so important, there was one for each apostle. Every one of them. You, you know, you know. this morning I started a new diet. I know you're in shock. Every Sunday it seemed like I started a brand new diet. Started a new diet this morning, and uh, it's low carb. For, uh, it's the only second time I've ever done long, low carb. And so Donna fixed me some bacon and a low carb piece of toast. You know where that came from? It came from God. The, the provision I had, yeah, we went to the store, we used the money, we bought the groceries, but the provision came from God. And He gave me well, what we needed, and I ate it. And so the, the test, the, the lesson from the miracle of five loaves is this, is He is a provider. You do not have to depend on yourself. And it doesn't mean that men need to be liabouts and be lazies, but it does mean this, God is going to be faithful to His people. And, and so, you would think of seeing something so incredible, it would have stuck home. But it didn't. You know, can you imagine the Lord Jesus keeping just breaking off pieces of fish and bread and, 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 and filling up Peter's basket and filling up Andrew's basket and y'all see y'all take it on out and, and then doing a, a Thaddeus's and getting all fixed up so you bring that one on out and just keep on, keep on, keep on. You know what? I think it would have knocked you down. But it didn't. See, Peter was not on over. Peter really didn't learn that much from this. And you know what? So, you know why some people continually go to church and go to church? It's simply this. Their hearts have never been opened. They don't understand this. And when it is, it is a gift of God. Go with me to the Gospel of Mark uh, very quickly. Uh, Mark 8, verse 18. Mark 8, uh, verse 18. The Bible says this. 
having eyes, see you not, and having ears, hear you not, and do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of the fragments took you up? And they said unto him, Twelve. So he asked them some questions, and this was this Can you see and can you hear? This morning I asked you the same thing Can you see and can you hear? Because, see, some cannot. And, and, you know, we immediately want to say, yes, I hear. My, my hearing is slipping. It really truly is. And, and we want to make, but, you know, we don't all have a spiritual ear. Right. We all do not have a spiritual eye. And that's why we get so tore up and so, and, and you see things happen on TV and, and this and that and, and, and disasters. And the reason why it upsets you, you're looking through your carnal eye. But do you have a spiritual... You know, you know how the very fact that you, that you needed a Savior was revealed with you? It was a spiritual eye. Uh, because man, man by and large thinks that he'll take care of himself and he'll be fine and, and he'll be okay. But a spiritual eye and a spiritual ear. And so we find then that probably, uh, very surely, that Peter didn't get it. Now, Matthew, back to Matthew 14. Uh, we're going a little further down, and you know the miracle of the 5,000 men that we just read. Now, a little further down uh, in, in, in Matthew 14, uh, we see another great and wonderful miracle uh, in verse 24. Now, again, you remember these are back to back miracles. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea. Matthew 24, uh, Matthew 14, verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came unto them walking on the sea. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, and I always point this out, that Jesus specifically said, you go get in that ship and... I'll meet you on the other side. He directly, very intentionally, very purposefully put them in the very middle of the storm. Yeah. And you know what? He's going to do that to you occasionally. He's going to put, put you right in the middle of it. And, and you know what? Uh, a lot of people say, well, God is love. He won't do that. Yes, He will. Most certainly, you follow the lives of all of God's people. And you know why He does that? You learn to depend on Him. And you see Him in His ability to do great and wonderful miracles. Yes, He will do that. And He does do that to those that, that love Him huh, as they should. And, and so they, uh, they find themselves in a situation that God had deliberately put them in. And in the fourth watch, and that is just before sunrise, that they, He didn't come immediately to their assistance. He, he let them inside the storm for a while. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit! And they cried out with fear. Oh, what a, what a wonderful, can you imagine, what a wonderful, glorious sight when, when, when they looked out across the seas and the waves were doing this and the wind was blowing. And there's the Lord Jesus Christ walking on it like it was just this church floor. You know, that, that, that is an unbelievable thing, isn't it? Well, I wish I could have seen it. But if I saw it, I don't know that my response would have been much different than Peter's. And I say that because I know what I'm made out of. I, 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 know, I know how I think. I know how I act. I know myself. And everybody wants to get down on Peter. But he was needing something. I, I fully believe that, that, that Peter was in lack. He, that, he, that he needed something that he didn't quite yet know. Uh, they didn't quite yet understand as it was at this time. Verse 26, And His disciples saw Him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear, but straightway Jesus 
spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto the, thee on the water. And he, meaning Christ, said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked under the water to go to Jesus. Now, listen. <laughs> Don't you ever make no bold statement like that unless you mean it. Because, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder at this point if Peter really understood. I, I personally don't think he did. I don't think that he had seen Jesus fully as God. And I, I'll show you why in a minute I believe that. I, at this point, I don't even know if Peter had been converted. That's uh, right. He... <laughs> He didn't understand Christ for who He was. And you know why? Because it's a revealed truth. You will never know Christ until He's revealed to you. That, that, that's pretty sobering, isn't it? Uh, but it, but, it, but it's, it's a very true statement. And you think by this point He'd seen the five, feed, feeding of the 5,000. He'd, he'd seen the feeding of the 3,000. He had seen, he had seen the sick receive uh, health again. He'd seen the lame walk. He'd seen the blind see. And all of that was a glorious thing, but yet and still did he know who Christ was, and I really don't think that he did. And he, and he uh, verse 30, and when he, meaning Peter, saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, and he cried, and he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, this morning, that'd be a wonderful question for you to ask yourself. Is why, why do you doubt? And there's two possible questions, answers to that question. The first one is that you lost, that you really don't know Jesus. You think you do, but you really don't. That's a possibility for an answer. And the second one is this. Is that you've not trusted Him. You've not been through enough yet. Uh, you know, when I began to understand divine healing about 27 years ago, a boy back there in the sound room, almost a year old by this point, He'd been in the hospital. This was our third go round. They could not tell us what was wrong with him. They kept saying, "Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that." And it's, you know, it's kind of like uh, the woman with the issue of blood. Instead of doing better, he grew worse. And we took him over to Martin Hospital. And uh, I was really done stuff my way out. And uh, driving back to our apartment. And, I just laid it out before the Lord because I didn't know what was wrong with the kid. And next morning when I went over and went in the room with Donna and the baby, she says, they think it's something very simple, a urinary tract infection. And you know what? That's exactly what it was. Something that should have been found the first time. But you know, the reason it wasn't is I needed to learn something about God. And so, 25 years later, 15 years later, I can't remember, and 10 years ago now, when I needed brain surgery, I didn't waver at it. But if I knew my God was able. Jared, I don't know why that happened to Aaron's hand, but I do know this, God's in it. God's in it. And so, then we as the Lord's people, we certainly need experiences to teach us. And so, he sank even though he saw Christ there. Now, the Gospel of Matthew being written in sequential order, now I want you to go to Matthew 16 and verse 13, and we're almost done. Matthew 16 and verse 13, he had seen the 5,000, he had seen the 3,000, he had seen the baskets taken up, he had seen the lame walk, he had seen Christ walk on the sea. And then Matthew 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked his, disi his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 
Who do, who do people say Christ is today? We live in a very blasphemous age and some will even say Christ never existed. You'll have some say He was a good man, He was a good prophet. You know the Jews say that. Did you know that? The Jews will say that He was a prophet. You, you, you'll, you'll have others still saying things uh, like uh, He was a charlatan. He was a fake. See, the, the reason, reason why that, that those are things that are still being said today. Now, this is the thing here. You don't worry about what other people say about Christ. Because you know what? Knowing Christ is a revealed truth. And if you know Him as Savior, all you can do is lift up your hand and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because you know what? It's a rich and wonderful gift. It's nothing you've done on your own. And, and, and so then we, uh, the Lord Jesus asked him very directly, he's talking to all 12 of them, he said, who, who, what is the world's view of me? What do I look like to the world? And their answer was this, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto him, but whom say ye that I am? Now I ask you that this morning. Who do you say Christ is? Is Christ this morning on the, on the throne rubbing His hands together all stressed out about the political situation down here? He is not. Who do you say Christ is? Is Christ somebody that's try, trying to do something? Did you ever see anything in His ministry where He tried to do something and didn't get done? I don't know one thing to you. Who do you say that He is? Is He the sovereign King on the throne? Is that who you say He is? Uh, is, is He doing all things well this morning? Is that who you say He is? Do you, is He your counselor, your friend, and your brother? Is that who you say He is? Who do you say that I am? Now notice verse 16 says this, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. The Son of the living God. You see, somewhere in there, P uh, P Peter finally seen it. Somewhere along that way. He said, you know what? He is the Christ. It's a revealed, glorious, wonderful truth. And I personally believe somewhere in, in, from 14 to 16, Peter finally got it. He finally understood it. You know why? Christ took his blinders off. And you know how you'll see it one day? Christ will remove your blinders. And you'll see Him for who He is. You'll, 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 you'll rejoice. And, 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 and there's nothing, 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 nothing like it. Notice this. Verse 17, we're going to be done. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So how do you know Christ? He's revealed to you. Right? That's what the Bible says. Is it not? What's your brain made out of? It's a special kind of tissue or flesh called nerve tissue. But you know what it is? It's just flesh. It can't be revealed through flesh. The revealing of the Holy Ghost that Christ is the answer to your sins is everything. See, we need experiential salvation like Peter had, don't we? We need churches full of people that know Christ intimately. Not know about Christ, but know Him specifically and, and close that's a strong church. Did you know it? It don't matter if it's just a few people like it is here. If they know Christ intimately and they're engaged with Christ like that, that's all you need. It's all you need. So what about you this morning? Do you know Christ? I mean, really, do you know Him intimately? Uh, know Him better than you know your, your wife or your husband. Do you know Him that way? We need it. We need it.